But today we have uh, Nicole Younger Halpern will tell us a little bit about uh, the tales of two disciplines. Uh, so let me give you a little background on her. She, uh, she's, she's been here since almost a year, since, uh, since last year. She got her PhD at Caltech. Um, she spent some time at the Perimeter Institute um, and she got her undergraduate degree at Dartmouth. Let me see, uh, she's part of Quix and NIST. So she is here much of the time during the semester, day or so a week. Um, so it's easy to find her if you need to talk to her again. Uh, while she was at uh, an undergraduate, she graduated uh, co-valedictorian. So she's smart. So it's really somebody to talk to. Uh, she uh, was a uh, Perimeter Scholar International, Scholars International, I guess, when she was at the Perimeter Institute where she got her master's. Uh, she also was a, a, a postdoctoral fellow at ITEMP. At, uh, at Harvard, and she won this uh, award. Uh, let me see if I can pronounce it. Elia Prigoni, something like that, <laughs> uh, for thermodynamics. It's uh, it's not one that I'm terribly familiar with. Um, and she's written a book, and that's quite interesting. She's written a book, and the title of this book here is the physics. Uh, I'm sorry, it's uh, quantum steampunk, the physics of yesterday's tomorrow. And then she also writes a blog for, for, uh, for it's, it's Caltech, is that right? Yeah, so there's a monthly blog, the last of which just came out last month. So she's well read, well uh, written. So without further ado, Nicole. Thanks for the introduction. Thanks for hosting me here. It's good to be speaking on home turf. I'm going to talk about a story that began about a year ago when I ventured off to the Kavli Institute for Theoretical Physics in Santa Barbara, which some of you might recognize. The Kavli Institute is home to Mark Trudnitsky, whom many of you might know as a king of the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis, which has turned into its own subfield, the ETH. The ETH is a mathematical and conceptual toolkit used in many different subfields of quantum many body physics. It describes a closed quantum many body system that's governed by some chaotic, non integrable Hamiltonian. If a Hamiltonian and an observable obey the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis and the Hamiltonian lacks degeneracies, then the system will thermalize in the following sense or the observable will thermalize. If you have some fairly typical local observable O and you calculate its time T expectation value and then you average that over time, you'll find that that is equal to the appropriate thermal average plus some small correction. This correction is like one over the global system size. So I'm representing the global system size by N. Also, if anyone has more of a quantum information theory background here, I'm using O throughout this talk as my many body physics co-authors do. That is to mean scaled as or as people in quantum information theory might be used to a more precise meaning that relates to a bound. So if you have the ETH and a non-degenerate Hamiltonian, then you can conclude that this sort of internal thermalization happens, at least ordinarily. However, a question came up because of quantum thermodynamics, which is in large part the community I come from. The quantum thermodynamics involves taking the thermodynamics of engines and efficiency and work from the 1800s and re-envisioning it for small systems, quantum systems, and far from equilibrium systems. If you're interested in this, learning more about this field, then I recommend these two review papers at the top. There's also the book that I wrote that was just mentioned. A question about the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis was motivated 
by a way of thinking that's been trending in quantum thermodynamics, thermodynamics over the past few years. Throughout thermodynamics, we often think about some small system that's interacting with a big bath so that the whole thing can form a closed quantum many body system of the sort often thought about in condensed matter and AML physics. The small system and big bath exchange things. If they exchange just heat, the small system may thermalize to a canonical state. If they exchange heat and particles, the small system may thermalize to a grand canonical state and so on and so forth for many different things that can be exchanged. These things that are exchanged are conserved globally across the system and bath composite, so I'll call them charges. I'll represent them by Qs and index them with alpha. In quantum thermodynamics, we represent these charges by Hermitian operators that we sometimes implicitly assume commute with each other. Now, this assumption is implicit. It was barely noticed until a few years ago. But it does lie behind some important arguments, such as some derivations of the thermal state's form. However, if we're using quantum theory, then what's really interesting is what happens when things don't commute with each other. So we're obliged to ask, what happens to thermodynamic arguments and phenomena if the charges don't commute with each other? This question has led to a growing subfield within the intersection of quantum information theory and quantum thermodynamics. This is a very small sampling of the papers that have come out. Here are a few of my favorite insights from this way of thinking. First, suppose that you have two different baths at two different effective chemical potentials, and you let charges flow between them. Then, entropy will be produced in each of the baths, and the entropy production rate can be decreased by non-commutation of the charges that are flowing. And we tend to like to avoid entropy production because we like to have efficient machines. So you can address these systems with an open systems framework. And in this case, you can find that the steady states, since they have certain degeneracies, can encode information. Some of you might be familiar with the resource theory framework. This is a mathematical toolkit developed in quantum information theory that's been applied to all sorts of things, quantum computational resources, thermodynamics, entanglement, and more. You can model these systems with resource theories and derive analogs to the second law of thermodynamics. So the first experiment in this budding subfield was recently performed with trapped ions in Innsbruck. I'll also point out that Alex Lasek, who is a postdoc here, was involved with this study. So if you're interested in the background of this little growing subfield, then I'll point to chapter 12 of this book. So when I was visiting the Kavli Institute for Theoretical Physicists as a quantum thermodynamicist, I went over to Mark Stranitsky and asked, well, what happens to the ETH if the Hamiltonian conserves quantities that fail to commute with each other, prompted by this line of thinking in quantum thermodynamics. Mark at first said, oh, everything works out just as usual. And then he said, hang on, actually it doesn't. No, it does it or doesn't it? It wasn't clear for a few reasons. Here are some reasons why a Hamiltonian that conserves quantities that fail to commute with each other might violate the ETH and its predictions. First, if a Hamiltonian conserves quantities that fail to commute with each other, then it'll have degeneracies. And we said that non-degeneracy went into the argument for thermalization together with the ETH. If the Hamiltonian conserves just quantities that commute with each other, then there might be degeneracies, but we can ignore them by working in a charge sector. So an eigenspace shared by the conserved quantities other than the Hamiltonian. We call this a microcanonical subspace. If the charges don't commute with each other, then they don't share an eigenbasis and they tend not to be able to have well-defined values simultaneously. So we shouldn't expect any shared eigenspaces 
we shouldn't necessarily expect microcanonical subspaces where we can apply the ETH as usual. Okay. Yeah. Just to help us focus, could you give some examples of things we might be familiar with that would be in this category that is not maybe uh, characters sure. that are conserved, or maybe remind us? I mean, for example, the usual things I assume when we talk about energy and number in terms of canonical, that those with those uh, do escape. Is that? Yes. <laughs> and so an example that I'll talk about in more detail shortly of non commuting conserved quantities can consist of a system whose uh, spin, uh, whose spin in all different directions, SX, SY, and SZ are conserved. Also, you might remember from studying for your qualifying exams, something called the wigner eckert theorem. I'll review this in more detail, but the wigner eckert theorem is a constraint on the elements of matrices that represent observables. But also the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis is a constraint on the elements of matrices that represent observables. These two constraints have nothing to do with each other and even conflict with each other. So for all these reasons, if a quantum system has quantities that are conserved that fail to commute with each other, we need to rethink the ETH and our expectations of that thermalization. I had the pleasure and privilege of realizing that and then working on a solution with this wonderful team of people. This is Chaitanya Murthy, who's at Stanford, Arman Babakani, who's in, UL, who's in LA, USC or UCLA, Fernando Iniguez is in Mark Srednitsky's group, and they're at the University of California, Santa Barbara. We proposed a non-abelian eigenstate thermalization hypothesis to overcome the conflicting constraints that I mentioned. We also showed that you can use this non-abelian eigenstate thermalization hypothesis to show that for a range of observables, thermalization does happen in the ordinary way although the proofs are much more complicated. Also, there are some cases that seem to allow for a, an unusual or anomalous thermalization. The time average expectation value equals the appropriate thermal expectation value only to within larger corrections, which are polynomially larger in the system size. And I find this result interesting because it's, it shows that there's some re resistance to thermalization in the ordinary sense. And thermalization goes along with the arrow of time. So it's almost as though there's a little bit of resistance to time's arrow as it usually manifests. Also, if the system doesn't get as far down to the thermal state as usual, then the system may retain some extra information about its initial conditions maybe we could take advantage of that for storing information. But in summary, if we introduce non-commuting conserved quantities, then we need to revise the ordinary eigenstate thermalization hypothesis that probably many of us here use quite a bit, and arguments for thermalization. So, so if I could maybe I'm going to follow on Bill's question. Does charge here simply mean a conserved quantity? A globally conserved quantity. So we shouldn't confuse it with electric charge or other. It's not necessarily charge. electric oh, charge. It's just a conserved. There's a constant of the motion. There are right. constants of motion and energy. Do not confuse. Right. In the many body Right. Yes. Uh, when you talk about the conserved, what it's it's preserved by, by some Hamiltonian. Right. Which one would you consider about? Because I imagine. Like, is it okay if the subsystem Hamiltonian doesn't commute with some small coupling to the environment that you don't actually, that never appears in the thermal system? So we have the setup, and I'll go over it in more detail, of a closed quantum many-body system. It's governed by some Hamiltonian, and that Hamiltonian conserves an unobservable. We'll call that the charge. So it is, uh, it's the Hamiltonian including the Hamiltonian on the back. First, we should briefly review the ordinary eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. 
it concerns a quantum many body Hamiltonian that has some eigen decomposition. We say that a Hamiltonian and an observable satisfy the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis if the following is true. Let's take the observable represented as a matrix relative to the energy eigenbasis and look at an, an arbitrary element of that matrix, O alpha alpha prime. If the two satisfy the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis, then the observables matrix element has the following form. It consists of two terms. The first term is called the diagonal term because it's non-zero in light of this delta function, only if alpha equals alpha prime. And so the row and column of this matrix have the same index. The second term is called the off-diagonal term very creatively. This script E is the average of the two energies associated with the row and the column. Omega is the difference between the two energies. This big O out front is the microcanonical average of the observable. It's some smooth real function. This S sub thermodynamic is the thermodynamic entropy, the logarithm of the density of states at the energy E. This F is some other smooth real function. It'll govern how the system gets down to thermal equilibrium. This R at the end, you can think of loosely as a random number. So here's a pretty simple argument for how the ETH plus a non-degenerate Hamiltonian imply thermalization of the observable. Again, we'll denote the size of the global system by N. Our system is going to start in some initial pure state. We can write it as a linear combination of energy eigenstates with these weights C alpha. We'll assume that this is in a microcanonical subspace. For the moment, I'm thinking that the Hamiltonian is the only conserved quantity. And Hamiltonian is special. It generates the time evolution. So we don't want to work in an eigenspace of the Hamiltonian. Then nothing would happen to the state. Instead, we want for the Hamiltonian just to have a small variance. The state evolves in time by acquiring relative phases. We can use those to substitute into the time average or the time evolved expectation value of our observable. Here's the general expression. We substitute in and we get two terms. Again, one term is the diagonal term because it contains only these diagonal elements of the matrix. And again, very creatively, the other term is called the off diagonal term. Now we average in time. We take this time T prime expectation value. We integrate over time. We take the average and we take the limit as the time approaches infinity. But what happens to each of these two terms above? The first term gets mapped to zero because we have this phase here. In the time average, the phase will vary randomly. There will be phase cancellations. We get zero. This would be non-zero if any of the E alphas equals an E alpha prime, because then this exponential would have an argument of zero. The exponential would be one, and it wouldn't cancel out. But we assume the Hamiltonian is non-degenerate. In this other term, we have this O alpha alpha prime. We can apply the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis and see that this is about equal to the microcanonical average, which we can bring outside of the sum. Then we're left with just a sum over the coefficients mod squared, but our initial state is normalized one, so this sum simply equals one. Therefore, our time average simplifies a great deal just to the microcanonical average. Moreover, this microcanonical average equals the appropriate thermal average. And the appropriate thermal average, when just the Hamiltonian is conserved, is the canonical average, plus these order one over system size corrections. In summary, the time averaged expectation value, I'll get to you in just a moment, is the appropriate thermal expectation value plus corrections of order one over the system size. Yep. So this, this was a state infinite time average at finite system size, right? Yes. Uh, but, you know, I think strictly speaking, that requires that the time be both bigger than exponentially the system size, because the level space 
Um, so like, are there, what sort of results are there of like, like finite time averages and how to like mirror scale time? That depends on the off diagonal term in the ETH and that smooth function F. And I agree that that's those, that kind of subtler question is definitely worth exploring. This is just the one of the simplest things you can do. Take the infinite time average. And after you do that, then you can ask the, the harder question of, well, how does the system get to the infinite time average? What if you have a finite time? For sure. Is there no like simple, like very rough estimate here versus one that you would like I'm not sure. And also the F, the smooth function F, I think is model dependent. For sure, yeah. So I'm not sure if there are kind of universal answers. Okay. Again, this thermalization happens ordinarily in the absence of charges or especially charges that fail to commute with each other. Suppose that we have just charges that do commute with each other. Often that we're, we'll be interested in a Hamiltonian that's conserved and also the particle number or the Z component of the total spin of a spin system. In this case, again, we'll work in a sector, an eigenspace of the particle number or the Z components associated with a small spread in the energy. In this case, the small system will thermalize to the grand canonical state which looks in a way that hopefully you remember from statistical physics class. And if we have particle number instead of an SC, then you just replace what's in the exponents. By the way, there are plenty of seats in the front in case people who came in want to sit down. If multiple charges that do commute with each other are conserved, then we can find an eigenspace that is shared by those conserved quantities. And again, we will call that uh, at least a part of it that's in a that is associated with a small spread of energy, a microcanonical subspace. Now let's switch focus from background material to what happens or what we can make of charges that fail to commute with each other. We're going to consider a closed quantum many body system that is consists of some number n of subsystems, identical subsystems. I'm going to illustrate with subsystems that consist of qubits, although we expect results to generalize. This closed quantum many body system is governed by a Hamiltonian that's chaotic or non integrable. I'll denote its eigenvalues by E alpha. And this Hamiltonian conserves global charges Q alpha. The number of charges is much less than the system size, so that we don't have to worry about integrability effects. Again, at least some of these charges don't commute with each other. The example I'm going to focus on consists of the components of a spin angular momentum. If you're interested in generalizations to other classes of charges, then you can check out this paper. We recently had a seminar by Shan Majidi, my co author here. And this concerns how to build Hamiltonians for closed quantum many body systems that globally conserve charges that don't commute with each other and locally transport those charges around. The Hamiltonian shares with the Z components as well as the total spin squared an eigenbasis. The Hamiltonian again has eigenvalues E alpha. The Z components of the spin has eigenvalues that I'll label by M. I'm setting H bar to one. And S alpha is the spin quantum number. We're going to be interested in an initial state that has this decomposition relative to our favorite basis. Now the coefficients are labeled not only by alpha, but also M. The Hamiltonian has an expectation value that is extensive in the system size. This is so that we will have the Hamiltonian and an initial state that will expect should be able to thermalize well, according to at least what we know about the absence of non commuting charges. I'll label by M, big M, the expectation value of the Z component of the spin. Uh, 
And I'm also going to orient the z-axis such that the expectation values of the x and y components are zero. And also big M is positive. We're going to be interested in an initial state that's in a generalization of the microcanonical subspace. We said that if the charges don't commute with each other, then we shouldn't expect them to be able to have well-defined values simultaneously. So we shouldn't expect them to share eigenspaces or microcanonical subspaces. So we generalize the notion of microcanonical subspaces to approximate microcanonical subspaces. Sorry about how many syllables that name has. Here, each charge just has a fairly well-defined value. So if you measure any global charge, you have a high probability of getting an outcome close to the expected value. So for instance, suppose that we measure any one of the charges. I'll plot the possible outcomes along the x-axis. Along the y-axis, I'll plot, or sketch really, a probability density. We're interested in a distribution like this. So it has a peak about the expected value, which is the analog in our problem of the total particle number in the ordinary grand canonical problem. And this width should be somewhat small for dealing with many body physics, then we might demand that the variances of our conserved quantities are at most of order system size. For instance, all product states will satisfy this assumption. Now that we've covered, yep. So I think I did. Why are we talking about initial states? Doesn't indicate specifically about the The ETH is a statement about matrix elements relative to the energy eigenbasis and so about energy eigenstates. What we're really interested in, well, uh, and okay, so I would agree that we're also interested in a statement that's analogous to that. Something else that we're interested in is the argument that if you have satisfaction of the ETH and a non degenerate Hamiltonian, you can derive thermalization. That argument, that derivation of thermalization, also will change. And that thermalization, that statement of thermalization says if you have some initial state that satisfies certain assumptions. You have an observable and a Hamiltonian that satisfy the ETH. You take the time averaged expectation value of the observable. So you evolve the state for a while, you take the expectation value, you time average, then you get the thermal average. That's why we need the initial state. Okay, so you'll still be formulating ETH separately without reference to that initial state. Correct. Correct. But do you require that the variance be this big in order to satisfy the usual uh, requirements for the for the thermalization? We have only an upper bound. We don't need for the bounds to be saturated. Okay. But on the other hand, it can't be zero. <laughs> it can't be zero for all of them, except in a few very special subspaces. Like in the example of spin, there's only one eigenspace shared by all the charges. Now that we've talked about the setup and Hamiltonian and states, let's talk about observables that we might expect to thermalize because of what we know from many years of dealing with the ordinary ETH. First of all, we can express an observable relative to our favorite basis. So we can express an observable as a linear combination of the components of spherical tensor operators, which you probably also remember from your qualifying exams. I'm sometimes just going to call so a spherical tensor operator is a tensor. It's like a matrix. It has lots of components. The components are labeled TKQ. But I don't want to keep saying components of spherical tensor operators because that has a horrible num number of syllables. So sometimes I'll just call the TKQ themselves spherical tensor operators. But what are these? I like to think I like to keep in mind the simple example of a photon impinging on an atom. The photon is going to act on the atom in a way that is described by a spherical tensor operator acting on the state of the atom. The photon has a spin one so we will associate it with an operator of k equal to one. And if the photon gives the atom one quantum of the z components of angular momentum, 
then we'll associate the action with an operator with Q equal to one. So the state of the atom gets acted on with this T11 operator. And this T11 operator is just a raising operator, so something that we're all very familiar with. I'll focus on K body observables that acts non-trivially on just K of the qubits. I'll make K be constant in system size. So you can think of this as a local Q body observable that we would ordinarily expect to thermalize. You can think of this loosely as um, one of our spherical tensor operators with its little k equal to big K. And you can think of that roughly as a product of single spin operators, wherein the single spin operators, um, there are just K of them, loosely speaking. Whenever we talk about spherical tensor operators, we end up talking about the wigner eckert theorem. Again, you probably encountered this in grad school or undergrad, maybe haven't used it since. It's a constraint on the elements of matrices that represent observables relative to our useful basis. So suppose that we take one of our symmetry adapted operators, we represent it as a matrix relative to this shared basis, and we look at an arbitrary element of the matrix. We find, according to the theorem, that it has a certain structure. The matrix element is a product of two factors. The first factor is a Klebsch-Gordon coefficient. That's how you convert between a tensor product states and an eigenstate of global spin observables. For instance, if you have in mind a singlet state and you ask how much of this singlet state is consists of the tensor product zero, 01, the answer is given by a Klebsch-Gordon coefficient. The other factor is a reduced matrix element. It's just the parts of the matrix element that is Hamiltonian dependent, but does not depend on Q. You'll see that there's no Q in this reduced matrix element. Now, when I'm thinking of the track I'm always thinking of but I get the feeling that you're thinking about it more globally. Is that true? I'm going to use it only in the context of angular momentum, but I believe that there is a generalization. Okay. Yeah, yeah, of course, it. electric multiple or magnetic multiple means. Uh, right. Okay. And that is part of the opportunity for future work, <laughs> extending this framework to generalized such Gordon coefficients. I don't have to think about it right now. Right. <laughs> okay. So here we have one constraint on the forms of elements of matrices that represent observables. But again, the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis was such a constraint. And these constraints butt heads. We're going to resolve that conflict by doing away with the ordinary ETH and proposing a new ETH for this reduced matrix element. The non-abelian eigenstate thermalization hypothesis is as follows. We propose that the reduced matrix element has the following structure. Again, we have a diagonal term that has this delta function ensuring that alpha equals alpha prime and an off-diagonal term. You'll recognize this script E as the average of the energies associated with the row and column. But now we also have a script S associated with that equals the average of the spin quantum numbers labeled by alpha. Similarly, just as we had a difference omega between the two energies, we now have a difference nu between the two spin quantum numbers. This TK is some smooth real function. It's analogous to the microcanonical average from the ordinary ETH. This smooth real function is going to come up again and again. So I'm going to put a little gold star here so that you'll recognize. This S thermodynamic is now the thermodynamic entropy at the energy E and the spin quantum number S. Again, F is some smooth real function that determines how the state arrives, toward, arrives at thermal equilibrium. And again, you can think of our alpha alpha prime approximately as some random variable. Does, does it matter what, how you model the random variable? 
So this R alpha alpha prime is actually an element of a Hermitian matrix that um, around or within some small energy window and spin window, well, the, the elements associated with a uh, small energy window and spin window will have uh, zero average and unit variance. So it's kind of a structured randomness. So, uh, so because of the delta function, like delta alpha alpha prime, I guess those averages in the first term are just like s plus alpha, s alpha plus s alpha prime over two is just s alpha, right? Just checking. In the first term, in yes. The first term, yeah. Yes. And alpha just includes like the m s z, let's say quantum number, but doesn't know anything about the s x quantum number. So s alpha is the whole spin quantum number. So if you take, I don't see markers, but if you, ah, oh, thank you. If you take all of the components of the spin, you add them together, then you get this. And um, this has eigenvalues labeled by S alpha. Right. And I guess you also want to see. Like usually so, when we talk about it. Oh, maybe, maybe you're asking in here we see the influence of S alpha, but we don't see the influence of M, which is the the eigenvalue of S Z. Why don't we see the influence of M in here? That could be what you're asking. Yeah, I, well, I think we did that would also include. I didn't realize I was not included. Okay, good. So that is what I'm asking. Yeah. yeah um, Ultimately, because of the Wigner Eckert theorem, because this TK, remember it doesn't depend on Q. Sure. Now that we have our non abelian eigenstate thermalization hypothesis, let's use it. Let's see how well systems can thermalize in the presence of non commuting charges. First, we'll calculate the appropriate thermal expectation value. Well, what is the appropriate thermal state? So in quantum thermodynamics, we tend to call it the non-abelian thermal state. It's basically what you would expect. So it's an exponent with an inverse temperature that depends on the average energy, the Hamiltonian of the global system. This sum is over the charges. The mu's are effective chemical potentials. Here are other charges, and z is a partition function. In other fields, this might be called an instance of the generalized Gibbs ensemble. We define the inverse temperature and the effective chemical potentials in the way that's often done in many body physics or in analogy with that. We take the initial expectation value of the Hamiltonian and set it to the expectation value of the Hamiltonian in our thermal state. And we do the analogous thing with each of our charges. We have these constraints. We solve them for beta and the mu sub alphas or mu sub a's. Again, we oriented our z axis such that Sx and Sy have expectation values of zero. Therefore, the mu sub x and mu sub y equals zero. And our thermal state does have the same mathematical form as the grand canonical state. However, the physics here differs substantially from the physics in the case of thermalization to the grand canonical state for a few reasons. First, if there is just grand canonical thermalization, then just energy and particles or energy and z components of the spin are hopping around. Here we have three non-commuting quantities in addition to the energy that are transported locally and conserved globally. Second, in the grand canonical case, again, even if the um, preservation of the particle number would introduce degeneracies into the Hamiltonian, we could get rid of them just by working in a sector, an eigenspace of the particle number. Here, the Hamiltonian has definitely has degeneracies, and in most cases, we can't get 
all of the charges to have well-defined values simultaneously. So usually there is no microcanonical subspace available to us. The third, and okay, so that is also partially point three. Now that we've specified the thermal states, we can evaluate the thermal expectation value of our observable. So here's the definition of the expectation value. We substitute in for our thermal states. We use the Wigner Eckert theorem. We use the non abelian eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. And we eventually find this expression, which we can break down. This delta function means that the um, thermal expectation value is non zero only if Q is non zero. Uh, excuse me, only if Q is uh, zero. So, in our example in, in which we sort of started getting intuition about spherical tensor operators, this is like having a photon that impinges, impinges on an atom and does not give the atom any quanta of angular momentum. That's when this thermal expectation value is non zero. The sum here is over our quantum numbers. This exponential is a thermal weight from the thermal state. This is a Klebsch Gordon coefficient. And this t, t is the smooth real function that I said we would see again and again, analogous to the microcanonical expectation value in the ordinary eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. Okay, now that we have the thermal expectation value, we can deal with the time averaged expectation value. Again, we specified an initial state. As it evolves in time, it obtains relative phases. We can plug that state into the expression for our time t expectation value. Again, apply the Wigner Eckert theorem. Again, apply the non abelian eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. And then average over time. This is our time averaged expectation value. It also has a sum over our, the labels for our quantum numbers. These C star and C are coefficients from our initial states. Again, we have a Klebsch Gordon coefficient. And again, we have this smooth real function that I said we'd see again and again. We now have our two averages. Let's compare them. We calculated the thermal expectation value and we calculated the time expectation, the time averaged expectation value. These two averages do not obviously equal each other to within the ordinary one over system size corrections. For starters, there's a delta function in one of these averages, and the other average doesn't have that delta function. This delta function implies that this Klebsch Gordon coefficient over here can have any value for Q but q is always zero up here. Similarly, remember when we used the ordinary ETH, the C star and the C collapsed into a C modulus squared, and we could use the normalization of the initial state. We can't do that here. In order to make progress to try to show that these about equal each other, we need to make an assumption about the scaling of the expectation value of the Z components of the spin. First, suppose that that expectation value is extensive. It grows like the system size. Then we can show that the time averaged expectation value equals the thermal expectation value to within the ordinary small corrections. That argument is significantly more complicated than in the case of the ordinary ETH without non-commuting charges. And we actually need different arguments for different classes of observables here depending on their symmetry properties, their values for Q. A key ingredient in these arguments is the assumption that our initial state is in an approximate microcanonical subspace. So the variances of all the charges are not too big. Now, suppose that the magnetization is all the way at the opposite extreme. Instead of growing like the system size, it's zero. We managed to find two cases in which anomalous thermalization may happen. The time averaged expectation value minus the thermal expectation value is of order system size to the negative one half, which again is polynomially larger than the ordinary corrections. 
So the time average expectation value remains a greater distance from the thermal expectation value. For example, suppose that our observable is rotationally invariant. Then our argument is based on an assumption that we argue is physically reasonable. The argument is based on the existence of bound states. But we assume that this smooth function, if you tailor approximate it with a small s, then it contains a term that's linear in the spin density. So those are the key ingredients in that example. And again, I find this results about not quite getting as far as usual toward to thermalization interesting because it exhibits a little bit of a resistance to the arrow of time, which maybe we could use to store quantum information. First, are any are there any questions? Yes. The previous slide, uh, I think there was a delta q zero. Yes. Uh, that means like the value is zero except when the photon does not record any angular momentum. And so maybe I maybe I said it wrong. Did I say it wrong? Yes. I I agree with you that since there's a delta q so q comma zero, if in our simple example, the photon imparts no angular momentum, um, then the delta function is one. So th this is non zero. So, how often does that happen? Like, to the general case when the photon imparts some, some angular Let's see. So, I presented the photon and atom example just as a simple example so that we could gain intuition about what spherical tensor operators are like. But now we have some quantum many body system. And granted, that might be an atom with a whole bunch of electrons. Um, as to the likelihoods, that's something I haven't thought about. Yes? Where did this uh, mass state come from? The, the hypothesis or five? Yeah, that has its own history. So a few years ago, some of us in quantum thermodynamics realized that at least one of our ordinary derivations of the thermal states forms, the canonical state, grand canonical states, uh, isothermal isobaric states, you know, didn't work if the charges failed to commute with each other. So we really didn't know whether there should be a state that anyone should write down. And then Three groups basically at the same time came up with some kind of physical justifications of the state. And those justifications were more kinematic than dynamical. Um, but they were kinematic justifications. So we started and then we asked, well, can we observe it in numerics? Can we observe it in an experiment? And we saw thermalization toward that state, even if we couldn't exactly hit the state because of finite system sizes. And I view this as a dynamical justification for writing down the state. But I guess it is technically been a hypothesis in the way that you believe this question. Hypothesis has been verified through many, many, many ways. Yeah, or also, well, there are many ways to derive the form of the thermal states, whether just energy is conserved or energy in particles and so on. And some of those derivations are just work. And so we have good good justifications for the grand canonical states. And we have kind of generalizations of some of those for this non-abelian thermal states, although the results are not quite as tight. So, so is it derived or is it derived? It's more like, uh, let's have a longer discussion about this yeah. during the Q&A because <laughs> it is a little technical. But let's say we've accumulated evidence that it's a reasonable state to write down. It's a good expectation. And we looked at a whole bunch of alternatives and said, this is the best thermal state that is around, basically, that we know of. Is there a reason that this S squared is not included as a Lagrange multiplier in that mass state? Yes. One way that you can derive the thermal state's form is by thinking, I have a small system, I have a big bath. The two of them have some total entropy. And at thermal equilibrium, that entropy is maximized. 
And then we divide that entropy into a contribution from the small system and a contribution from the big bath. The entropy depends, is, is extensive. And that entropy, uh, when you uh, exponentiate it, gives us the exponential that basically is our thermal state. And it's because the entropy is extensive and this S squared is not extensive that we don't include the S squared. I'm because the reason I, I'm asking is because that operator still commutes with everything. Else. Yep. Uh, so it feels like based on the usual stuff we should be there. From what I know of this derivation, it's just uh, extensive quantities. And if you took the square root of it, then since you're taking the square root of a square, I think it would still be non extensive, even though it would, it would probably be approximately extensive. Yeah. Okay, so this leads to a bunch of opportunities for future work. And if anyone wants to work on any, then please feel free to let me know. First, we said that it seems there should exist some smooth functions, T, some observables that exhibit this anomalous thermalization. It would be great to find them. I also talked about two extremes. If the magnetization is as big as possible, we see thermalization. If the magnetization is as small as possible, we don't necessarily. What about everything in between? There actually seems to be a rich spectrum with a whole lot of cases, and those merit exploration. We had analytical arguments. It would be useful to try them out numerically and potentially experimentally, depending on precision available. And again, at least there are some, there's an initial experimental result in this subfield of the thermodynamics of non commuting charges with trapped ions. As was mentioned, some of what we were doing was specific to the symmetry group SU2, but there are plenty of other non abelian groups that we might be interested in exploring, for instance, if we have an interest in high energy physics. I mentioned that this small f that appears in the second term in the non-abelian ETH relates to the process of thermalization. We could study this function in examples and figure out, does non-commutation of the charges influence the process of thermalization? Since our system might not get as far as usual down to thermal equilibrium. It might retain some information about its initial conditions. And can we use this retention for the storage of quantum information? Finally, probably a number of people here are familiar with quantum many body scars. They also, in some cases, disobey the ordinary eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. They have an emergent SU2 symmetry and they defy thermal predictions. We came at the problem completely differently from thinking about quantum many body scars, but maybe there is some connection because of the shared properties. In summary, we saw that if you take non commuting charges from quantum thermodynamics and add them to the ETH from many body physics, it's not clear what happens. We can start to get around this problem by introducing a non abelian eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. We showed that for a range of setups, thermalization does happen to the ordinary extent. However, in at least two cases, there's an opportunity for anomalous thermalization. The time averaged expectation value of a typical local observable should get to the thermal expectation value only with, to within larger corrections. Now, I find this interesting for fundamental reasons and the possibility of applications. Finally, we saw there's a lot more to do. On the note of quantum thermodynamics, I wanted to mention that together with Chris Jarzinski and other collaborators, I'm establishing, we're establishing a quantum thermodynamics hub based at the University of Maryland. And it's basically open for business starting this month. So we're going to have symposia, an international conference, and a lot of visitors and seminars. So please reach out if you're interested in participating or getting notices.
Thanks for your time. So we have time for some more questions. Um, and can you please try to repeat the questions from the room so that people answer? Well, there's a couple over here. Chris has one. Why don't you go, Chris? Oh, so you mentioned the Hamiltonian is assumed to be chaotic. Does that mean you're assuming it has a well defined classical counterpart or, or and it's not that it's being by chaotic? Non integrable, let's say. Okay, just in general, not. Yeah, and so scare quotes on chaotic since. Different people have different opinions about what chaos is. 